So um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce today's speaker, the second in a series of rappers, uh, who um, Joel Repper, who is a professor of digital culture at the University of Bergen in Norway, a mere hop away from TF Green these days. <laughs> uh, we're hoping maybe we can make them the official uh, electronic writing airline. They'll cut the old so that uh, our electronic writers and their electronic writers can work together. Um, so Jill, we're very lucky to have her because she's here as a visiting scholar at the MIT Comparative Media Studies program, uh, where she's working on a book called Snapchat visual, ephemeral, and conversational social media. Jill has been working on social media for a very long time. Her blog, Jill slash text, right, um, is on its 16th, 17th year, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And she wrote the first scholarly book on blogging way back when. Well, not that far. Not, not that far. 2008. 2008. So. So um, and uh, has also written a book on uh, selfies and seeing ourselves through technology, which is open access as well as purchasable. So you can go on her website and you can find the link to the book, uh, which you can read. Uh, so, and of course the best and coolest piece of news is that just yesterday, just yesterday, Joe received a European Research Council grant of $2 million, which will fund her graduate students so they can all work on how all of this machine vision that we're surrounded by when we take pictures, things recognize your face, things recognize your friends' faces, and how that sort of affects the way we see the world. So there, there'll be another book coming out on that, I hope, Can soon we? after the book on Snapchat. So without further ado, um, so. Thank you. Could I stop? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Could I start by asking how many of you use Snapchat? OK, excellent. How many of you actually uh, like make stories on Snapchat, the public stories? OK, so some of you. How many of you tend to look at the Snap map and things like that? Not that many. OK, so what I'm going to talk about today is how one of the aspects of how storytelling works on Snapchat. Um, there are so many things you can do with Snapchat. Um, and it started off as all being about you know, ephemeral, messages one-to-one, -one, a very private messaging system, and that's still how most people use it. Um, the aspect that really fascinates me most is the public aspect, or, or semi-public storytelling aspect, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, when, when I first actually realized that Snapchat was fun was when I discovered the uh, selfie lenses, <laughs> and I have yet to offer these to any adult or child without them ending up laughing and smiling. This is fun. <laughs> and this also got me started on thinking about how, um, what Snapchat is. Um, Ellie mentioned um, the grant that I'm going to start working on, which is about machine vision. This is clearly a form of machine vision, right? It's images, but they're being algorithmically altered. Interesting things are happening. But it took me a long time to get Snapchat. Um, I signed up when it was new because I'm a social media person. I started blogging in 2000, and I've been doing it you know, pretty much since. Um, but Snapchat, to me, was really hard to grasp because when I first signed up in 2011 or 12, none of my friends were on Snapchat because I wasn't a teenager. And <laughs> people I knew who were teenagers were too cool to send me messages, so I didn't get it. And I think a lot of people my age feel the same way. Maybe they still feel the same way. Fortunately, um, one of my teenage um, family members showed it to me again last Easter, and I realized it had changed. Not only were there selfie lenses, but there are also these openly available stories. So it's, a, it's become a media distribution system not just a private messaging system. So most of these stories, um, they used to be called live stories, now they're called our stories. They're, they're sort of changing as we go. Most of them are about ritualized events, like graduation, like, for instance, um, memorials, grievings, um, or about festivals, religious or cultural festivals. 
uh, or about football matches or concerts. And there's, in all of these stories, there's very much an emphasis on a collective kind of storytelling. And of course that happens because what, the way these stories are created is that individuals um, record a snap. Um, the stories are made mostly out of videos. You can, you can make a 10 second video in Snapchat or you can make a still image. Um, but your still images never get in the live story. So if you want to be in the big story, you've got to use video. And then you use these, um, these filters. See, these ones are for Ramadan, clearly. Although there are some extra ones, like this one's for the dawn prayer, for instance. This one is a very clear narrative prompt. During so on, I dot, dot, dot. And then you're, you're supposed to fill it out, right? So what you have is these filters, which... Oh, I haven't even explained what filters are. <laughs> Does everyone know yet? I'll show you. So basically, you take an image of, or a video on Snapchat and you can pull a filter over it. So in this case, I could pull the Ramadan filter on it. If I'd sent this to a live story, I suppose maybe it would have been considered. Because when you, when you take a snap, you can either send it to a friend or you can share it to our story or to the snap app. If you share it, it could be picked out and put in one of these um, stories. So the filters are pretty important here. I'm going to show you what a story looks like, don't worry. You're probably wondering and have no idea, unless you do have an idea at this point. The filters can be quite informational. So this is um, during the primary uh, debates. They had these very informational filters if you were in the place. So if I was taking a picture here during a primary debate somewhere else, I would not see these filters. But if I was in the location where the debate was going on, then I could take a photo or a video and swipe, and I would get these filters, which are live updated with you know, how, the, um, how people are ranked, etc. So there are different kinds of filters like that. If you're in a football match, um, then the filters may have the colors of your team, or they may have the score, for instance. During, for instance, Brexit, there were filters with like, how the count was going, etc. So a lot of these stories are, they're not trivial, they're ritual, really. They're collective uh, ritual events, weddings, like a weekend in June where a lot of people are getting married that Saturday, there'll be a story about weddings, you know, so, um, or graduations, etc. But sometimes they're about really um, the sorts of events that we're used to having told to us by professional journalists. Um, or they're mourning. Now, this is a story that was shown after the mass shooting in Orlando a year ago. And I've, I've, I want to show you most of it to give you an idea of how these things are made. So here you can see there's an info box here that has been added. The videos have been taken by individuals, but there's been information added by the curators of the story, so by Snapchat centrally, right? There are some selfies, but most of the pictures that are selected here show crowds. They don't show individuals. And I think that's a very conscious choice in what the curators have done. The sound is important as well. You hear the song of them singing. Maybe I'll turn this up a tiny bit, actually. You see, the, hear the sound of them. Well, you could potentially hear the sound of them singing. And, and they're, they're singing. Um, uh, we shall overcome and it's cut so that you can hear the song different verses of the song um, being sung in sequence but in different places around America they're using symbols like the candles that they're repeating they're very clearly showing that this is um, a global event these are um, well, across the United States at any rate, they've got the little, some of them have the geo filters that show the place, and other of these snaps, um, they've added the, the location. So it's very much expressing that this is a collective event. It's happening across the world, or at least across the nation. And then they're emphasizing the crowd, and they're emphasizing this repetition in the song. If you get to the end here, yes, if you, so they were singing that there, and if you are quiet and you just stay here, but you keep singing that in your mind, they will cut to the next verse of the song. It's very nicely done. Here's an example. This shot um, snap actually lasts for more than 10 seconds. It's clearly not shot by 
of ordinary individual. So sometimes they do bring in this sort of more standard, you know, journalistic footage. And then there's um, informational material added. Now, one of the important things about how this is actually experienced is that you watch this as it's happening. So if you'd opened your up Snapchat at you know, 1800 hours at 6 p.m. when this started, then you would see one snap. And then if you came back to it, you'd see the next one. So you get very much a feeling of this happening as you're watching. And the other thing is that it disappears. After 24 hours, the stories are gone. In fact, the stories sort of disintegrate because the first, often the first um, snaps will disappear before the later ones. So it's this really interesting kind of ephemerality. So this is an example of a, what, when it was still called a live story. This is from last summer, uh, or summer 2016. Since then, they've introduced something called the snap map, which works a little bit differently. Oh, but I did want to tell you that these are actually, this is a mass medium. Um, there are, you know, a, a couple hundred million people using Snapchat around the world, if not more. But of course, not everybody looks at the, the stories. When I went into a high school class and asked them, about half of them watched stories like this sometimes, and half of them just, were, they didn't care at all. So not everyone looks at this. But even so, Snapchat a year ago estimated that they said that 20 to 30 million people watch each of these stories, and that's a pretty large audience. Um, they have curators. This is a job ad for the kind of person they hire to actually curate these stories, an assistant story editor, for instance, or a news and current, current affairs manager. So they're actually creating media, but using these kinds of, of um, bits of stories from all around the place. And this is what actually um, Scott Retberg, who spoke last week, um, has written about collective narrative, and this is a kind of collective narrative that he calls contributory narrative, because the individuals contribute, but they have no control over the final product. Okay, this is how the Snapchat works now. Um, this is just an example from, do you remember when the truck rammed into the pedestrians in New York? They made this story out of the of, of footage that individuals in New York had shot of it. It's not shockingly graphic, so I'm... But shut your eyes if. Um, <laughs> notice that this is very not, it's not omniscient, right? It's no omniscient narrator. It's not people, and I have to turn up the sounds there a little bit. It's, it's people standing outside the event and they're going like, what, what happened? I don't know what's going on here. This is what people are saying. There is some infographics. That this has clearly been added by Snapchat because this is in a font and a style that's not accessible when you're in Snapchat yourself. Now, this is an NBC News person. So this is a journalist. So sometimes they insert um, this more authoritative kind of narrative to, to give you an overview. And the infographics give the overview too. But the images, the jerky shots, like this. Whatever's going on, it's bad. I mean, this is like how the crowd experienced this event. It's, we don't know, it's chaotic, it's very disturbing. It's also something that people obviously care about. So, oh, look at that. <laughs> um, so the way the snap map works is you, if, if you've got it at the, you open Snapchat and it's got the camera view, right? So you're looking at the screen and you either see what's there or it might show you your own face if you've got the selfie. Um, direction going on. If you zoom, let's see, if you zoom out, you see the image bigger, but if you zoom in with your fingers, you see the map, which I think is sort of a slightly poetic gesture in itself there. So it starts off with where you are, but then you can look around the whole world and you see the different places where there are activities. And under, <laughs> under my screen recording button, you can see New York at this point was a hot spot. There was activities there. <coughs> Now, I think the curators at Snapchat actually name events. So, for instance, up here you can see um, just north of Springfield, there's a blue spot. That means some people have been sharing snaps. You can click on that and you can see some snaps, but it's not a named event because it's not big enough or something. So, actually, I should just, I just want to stop that for a sec to explain to you that this is, um, 
This is where you can find the stories if you're not going through the map. And what I showed you was one of these contributory um, stories made by Snapchat users, you know. But there are also uh, big news channels. CNN has a channel, uh, why, you know, there's lots of companies, traditional media companies who pay Snapchat something to have what's called a Discover channel, where they share their content. And I want to show you how CNN covered the same event on Snapchat, because as you'll see, it's a pretty, if you're used to just ordinary news on television, it's, it's a fairly different aesthetic, but it's also very different from this collaborative version. It's not focusing on the crowd, it's authoritative, it's like, I am the journalist who will tell you what was happening. So I'll just show you a bit of that. So this is a much more, um, let me see, I'll just, that was a much more traditional form of storytelling. I mean, it's got the cool aesthetics, it's got the interesting graphics and stuff, but you know, it's somebody giving you this is the story. Um, so I'm really fascinated by this new kind of crowd storytelling that um, we're seeing in the other, uh, the other stories, the hour stories or the snap match stories. So I just wanted to show you a little bit what today's snap map, just a completely ordinary snap map experience is. Because, as, well, at least when I recorded this a couple hours ago, nothing very astounding was happening anywhere. And yet, there are obviously things happening on the snap map. So this is me. I haven't made myself a bit moji. So, um, or I did, but my kid changed it. and uh, <laughs> So I deleted it. So you zoom out, I mean, I clicked on Boston up here, and here are some things happening near Boston. Um, zooming out, you see like Magic Kingdom, right? Oh, I, I went so fast. But I noticed that in Chicago, there was a pro it said protest. So I click on that, and I see, OK, Columbia students are protesting. And again, this is a very kind of, um, if, if you're surfing through this, I can see I'm sort of doing it a bit too fast for you to really grasp it, probably. But if you're actually maneuvering through it yourself, it's a pretty interesting way of sort of seeing what is going on around the place. This is something going on in the Middle East today. I could have tapped to change perspectives because they have, um, like if several people were at an event filming from different perspectives, you can sort of skip between them. They sync it to the sound somehow. There's a fabric store on fire in, um, Saudi Arabia. And this is the same sort of crowd story of it as we saw for the New York event, you know. Um, National Day in Syria. Uh, no, in Jordan, not Syria. Um, if we go across Europe, you'll see, you know, all the big tourist attractions, the Louvre, for instance, they, they, there's always something happening at the Louvre. When we were in Paris last summer, um, I looked at the snap map, and sure, there's like the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower and all that have big stories constantly. But there was also a protest happening like a few blocks from where we were, and which I didn't know about. And that was kind of interesting. You know, you get these other stories as well. Football games, there's always stories about football Are those games. Your friends, no, it's <laughs> up in Songdal, it's where Hilda lives. <laughs> Oh, these are my friends, yeah. <laughs> they, they actually made Bitmojis and made themselves visible. Um, you can make yourself visible on the Snap Map. I think they probably made themselves visible just to their friends. I don't know, maybe they made themselves visible to everybody. Um, okay. So, these are ephemeral stories. There's sort of two main things I want to discuss with you today. The one is this collective form of storytelling, this work, new, well, it's not a completely new kind of narrative, but it's an interesting kind of narrative I think is becoming more and more common today. Um, and the other thing is the ephemerality of it, because when you post these stories, they disappear. 
which is really interesting. And it feels like something that's new, that's weird, right? Um, but of course, media has usually been kind of ephemeral. You know, it's print, we got print and print books are not ephemeral. Before that, pretty much everything was. Well, not stone tap. OK, OK, not everything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but even in the era of print, at least in the 20th, 20th century, newspapers get thrown out, except libraries take care of them, which is important. Um, broadcast media, until we got video cassettes, was very ephemeral. Um, Wendy Chun uh, has argued that this ephemerality is actually key to the digital. She says that people have focused so much on the archive and you know how the web is kind of an archival space that we've got so used to that being the default way that um, digital media works that we've forgotten that actually, as she argues, the very nature of the digital is ephemerality. It's degenerative, forgetful, erasable, she says, and that's just the very technical foundation of it, you know. The, um, the electricity needs to keep flowing for those, well, it depends a little, there are different kinds of storage, but. Um. And this is a definition um, that is off, it's actually a definition of social network sites from 2007. It has been cited like 12,000 times or something according to Google Scholar. People love this definition and they tend to use it as a definition of social media, not just social network sites as it was event, um, originally meant for. And it fits like Facebook or Friendster, which is what it was discussing, I think, largely at the time. You have a public or semi-public profile, you articulate a list of other users, and you can look at other users' friends. You, like, you can see, oh, I, that's your profile and these are your friends and I can move around like that. So it's sort of describing a hypertextual network, right? Um, Snapchat, I mean, it's almost as though Snapchat just deliberately tried to just do everything the opposite from that definition. Snapchat is not Facebook. It is completely not doing any of that. And yet it's very clearly a social media. But it is a very different kind of social media. Perhaps it is more natively digital, although it's not much that's native anything, perhaps. Um, so this idea that the ephemeral is weird, I mean, I think part of the reason that I, for instance, and many of my generation have found Snapchat hard to come to grips with is we're not, we have become used to writing. We have become used to archives, right? And maybe we're a bit like Plato who worry that, well, no, maybe Snapchat's a bit like Plato, sorry. Um, maybe we actually lose something by having all these archives. So when I started um, using Snapchat, I decided I would make um, a research story and post it to my, uh, and make it you know, publicly available on Snapchat um, every day for a month. And I more or less managed to do that. And I couldn't bear the idea of making these little stories, these two minute videos, and just letting them go away. So I stay at, um, saved them all and put the ones I liked on YouTube, which of course completely breaks the ephemerality idea of it. Um, and I think I was being an anti-Plato there because I was like, no, it has to be archived, you know. But um, maybe he has a point, though, because the ephemeral does maintain the conversation, the immediacy. If that snap map, if I could go back in time, like I, I saved a copy of that, the event in New York, so I could show it to you, but that's not accessible on Snapchat anymore. No. You can't see that anymore, and maybe that's good. Um, we have had a tendency in social media recently to sort of try to document everything, archive everything, like Facebook's having the entirety of your life, or these um, quantified self tools and li automated diaries that log every single place you are, you know, total control, total surveillance. In the EU, have you heard about the right to be forgotten in the EU? Yeah, you can say, mm -mm, I want that off the internet, and you can actually legally have it taken off the internet. Um, not in the US, but in Euro Europe you can. So maybe this ephemerality is something we need. So, moving towards a conclusion here. These live stories are watched by a lot of people. 
I, this is an old figure. This is a year and a half old, so I don't know what the figure is now. I haven't been able to find anything about that. Snapchat, in their terms of service, now Snapchat is, of course, a proprietary platform, right? There's no API. You can't really, well, you can search it to some extent now, but things disappear, and so they're gone. Um, it's not like a newspaper where you can keep your copy of that edition. Um, however, their terms of service actually specify that it's inherently public. They chronicle matters of public interest. And yet they disappear. And that's something I'm hoping, because some of you are here are with the digital library, and I think this is something that's quite interesting. The, if these are public, public chronicles of matters of public interest, should they be archived in some sense? I, I asked, I don't know what the Library of Congress thinks about this, but I asked the National Library in Norway whether they were doing anything, and they were like, we have more than enough just trying to archive the Norwegian web. It's like, that in itself is impossible. There's no way. They, I did suggest that they might want to, you know, the, the Norwegian newspapers, um, oh, what's the word in English? They have to depon, deponera, I don't even know the word. Oh, thank you. <laughs> they have to deposit, uh, you know, every edition of a newspaper has to be deposited, get sent to the library. So, you know, when CNN makes that story about, um, for Snapchat specifically, about the New York Times event, you could require that they deposit a copy of that somewhere. So that's something that could be done, I suppose. Um, but certainly the National Library in Norway is not, at this point, doing it. So presumably the only copy of these, of these texts, which I think are really interesting public documents, are made by the public and sh shown to a great many people, I think Snapchat's the only one that actually has a copy of them. Or I guess the CNN has a copy of what they made, but not the other stuff. Don't you know if they, if they keep it? I don't. I would sort of guess they would, but I don't know. I know from looking, because now, uh, now that they're a public company, they have to file, you, you, what, not exactly all their accounts, but they do have to file a report every quarter that's public. And it, it, they say that one of their greatest costs is service space. That they have to rent humongous amounts of service space, so maybe they don't save it all. Although just the videos of wouldn't, I mean, that's not uh, that much service space for anyone. So to conclude, and I, I'd love to hear what you think about all these things. There's a lot more to be said about all this. It's a commercial platform that we all contribute to, or not we all, but many, many people contribute to, and there's no public archive. And what does that mean? It's a kind of a privatization, I think, of the public sphere that we should be aware of. At the same time, it's immensely exciting to see the sorts of things that are happening on Snapchat, and I think that this kind of collective um, form of narration is something that we're going to see in many other places, too. Um, I've been doing some work in parallel with this on, uh, on a Norwegian uh, narrative called Scum, which means shame, which is... Um, told in social media but made by the public broadcasting company. So it's like a mix of social media and traditional storytelling. And it so clearly focuses on this kind of collective storytelling sense. And it finishes by drawing out the camera and showing us that the audience and all the comments the audience have written are actually the main characters of the, of the show. And I've been reading... Um, research on narratology, which talks about the we narrative. So novels, and they're talking about old novels, written in the first person plural. We are, we see. Um, uh, quite a lot of, um, there, well, there are many interesting examples of this. And, I, I'm, and these are recent articles about this form of narration, which I think is something that's going to become more and more common in our time. So if you want to hear more about what I've been thinking, these are my Snapchat. You can Google Snapchat research stories, and you'll find some of my Snapchat stories on YouTube. Or you can um, have a look at my books, or you can follow me on Snapchat. Thank you very much. We have lots of time for questions and comments from the users of Snapchat and the learners <laughs> about Snapchat and so on. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, and you said, I mean, you don't know whether Snapchat is saving these, but you saved something. So, I mean, how, I mean, there must be other people who are doing this too. So, you're, you know, there are people actually preserving some of these things. And, and, and how, is there a way to find those? Uh, I mean, would somebody, well, I guess if, if they 
Google your thing on your research stories, you know, they would find oh, uh, yeah. maybe what you have saved, but... Some of what I have saved, <coughs> absolutely, yes. Um, there are quite a lot of individuals who are sharing their individual stories that they've made. Um, I mean, not. Some people are putting them on YouTube. Um, <coughs> and then there are other stories like, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, you know, the first time there was a live story about Ramadan, the BBC wrote about it. <laughs> the BBC wrote about it and they included a video of some of it, right? So <coughs> some people have, like, documented or, or, or stored certain things. But in general, um, it's, yeah. Mm. Yes. I know you mentioned, um, you know, the quote from Plato, uh, writing will destroy memory. Mm -hmm. I know um, myself and a lot of other people like, <coughs> post to our Snapchat stories. Um, we will also save a copy of what we post, partially because uh, we like the idea of the ephemeral, where you know, after 24 hours it does disappear. But we like to retain like a private copy of what we shared as a memory for years in the future. So it's not just do you, me. <laughs> do you think that this, um, mm. you know, has any part in in kind of what you're researching? In that, you know, the media is ephemeral, but at some point we want to retain like a private memory of what we shared even mm. just for a short time? That's, a, that's an interesting point because what you're saying is we want the <coughs> ephemerality for like the publicness of it, right. but maybe that's a different thing for what we want for ourselves. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So, well Snapchat made the yet change maybe a year ago or something where, where it automatically now saves things as memories, but just locally for you. Um, and that is a major challenge. I mean, there were some people will say that breaks Snapchat because if you've saved, if you've got the snaps there, it's not ephemeral. It's like, ah. Uh, um, what do you think? <laughs> I, I like the idea of, you know, like you say, that news has always kind of been ephemeral. I, I like that, you know, it's different from sharing something on Facebook or Instagram where the public can see it, you know, or at least your friends list can see it until you delete it. Um, I like the ability to, you know, kind of have like private memories that at one point I did want, you know, my, my friends list to know about, but no longer do. Um, because I think that it, it kind of captures the time at which, you know, whatever I was posting occurred. Mm. And I don't necessarily want to retain that in a public sense, but that I will want to go back and look at, you know, mm. in the future. Mm. I, well, so I have a... Um, I met this young man who's a, he's a mobile journalist, and hearing him speak was, I researched blogs in the early 2000s, and there was all this excitement about citizen journalism, and there were people doing exactly the same thing, with exactly the same enthusiasm, but for Snapchat, right? And he, he does really interesting work on, um, Yusuf Omar is his name, he, he does this amazing work on, for instance, you may have heard about the uh, Snapchats, he did a story for the Hindustan Times where he interviewed victims of the acid attacks. And in order to keep them anonymous, he used selfie filters in Snapchat and allowed them, not just that, but he also allowed them to speak, to hold the camera themselves when they spoke because that made them, they felt more comfortable. They felt more in control, you know, um, in that way. He also runs, he's run these like mobile journalism systems where he sends journalists out with, with Snapchat and they take the videos with Snapchat and then they send them to him, he edits them um, back at the control room or whatever, and then they get posted both to the newspaper's website and to Snapchat. So there's lots of different ways of, of sort of combining, you know, the, the immediate, he, he said, he, he also said he uses the memory as like <coughs> just a storage bank of everything, but it's private. Mm. Right. Mm. Yeah. I'm just curious to hear if you have looked at Instagram um, while you were uh, working with Snapchat because I like am a recent and very infrequent Snapchat user and I remember it being described as like the anti-Instagram in a way. Like, Instagram is like the highly curated life and like you're putting your best sort of most fantastic self forward on Instagram and it is all archived for you. Whereas Snapchat, because it does disappear, you can be a little bit more like silly or it doesn't have to matter as much in a certain <coughs> way because it just disappears. 
So I guess I'm wondering if you looked at like a comparison of them at all. Yes. Um, I mean, there's been uh, quite a bit of interesting research analyzing the differences, especially with um, influencers like, you know, bloggers who, you know, sell products and, and uh, use it for marketing. They'll very often use, they'll have an Instagram account, which is like the very polished, beautiful images, and then they'll have Snapchat, which is sort of behind the scenes and much more informal. And it is interesting to see the connections between, you know, they're, they're basically telling the same story story in different modes on different platforms, which is really interesting. But then Instagram took the stories idea from, from <laughs> Snapchat, and so did Facebook. So now you're seeing more uh, of that in Instagram and Facebook than, uh, than earlier. So I think the, the division there has become between your glossy still images and your messy ephemeral stories, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So from what you were showing of the Orlando massacre, I didn't see that, but it reminded me much more of um, what was happening on Twitter and Facebook at the time where people from kind of all over, or whoever you followed or were friends with, were talking about this kind of one unifying event. Mm. Well, the way you seem to show the map has transitioned <coughs> Facebook in the last, I mean, um, um, Snapchat in the last year, makes it seem like they're less like Twitter or Facebook in becoming more like um, Yik Yak or like Pokemon Go and being very focused on a sort of uh, spatial geography. Is that a, is that something that you kind of agree with in terms of Snapchat's strategy? Well, clearly the Snap Map prioritizes location, obviously. And I mean, something I met, sort of thought of putting in here, but I didn't like, well, like Jeanette, who's a narratologist big in the 80s, 90s, um, talked about different ways of structuring a narrative. And the most traditional, the one that we've been most used to is temporal, because it's solapsis, it's grouping, how events are grouped. So temporal solapsis would be the one we're most familiar with, you know, this happened, then that happened, then that happened. This is clearly a different kind of storytelling, right? Jeanette also talks about you could have geographic solapsis, and he, he, he cites the journey narrative, which is an old form, you know, first we went there, and this is what we did, and then we went there. Or thematic solapsis, which you have in more like um, sort of episodic stories, where you tell a story and then it makes you think about something else that's similar in theme, and then you start talking about that. So I think one of the things this does is makes us think about the different ways narratives have been always been structured, right? Um, but clearly, on, on Twitter, hashtags are important. So it's a thematic, you could say, I'm not sure if thematic synapsis is the best way of talking about it, but it's certainly the topic, it's topic driven, right? <coughs> Although time is also important. Although with the, with the changes, uh, with, now that Twitter also emphasizes what's trending, so what are people talking about, and it also does that things, things you may have missed, so it brings up stuff that seem to be topically related to each other. So, Topics are important there. Whereas here, clearly, the map, I mean, where are you? And when I, and like, it's immediate, right? It's, it just happens. Twitter, you can search way back in time, although what it shows you automatically is what just happened. But, um, yeah, I think that, int that focus on the place and the immediate is really interesting. Mm. Being somebody who's of the Facebook generation and not quite Snapchat, but um, one of the things that I always have qualms about when I read these news stories or watch these feeds on Snapchat is that I feel that sometimes it makes feelings really ephemeral as well. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that the experience, let's say, of the Orlando protests um, or whatever is happening in the world, it becomes so much closer and so much more accessible and much more visceral. But in the same way, um, going off the same line of thought, it also makes intense feelings of such as love, grief, and in instances trauma, um, that makes it ephemeral as well because it disappears within 24 hours. And so I was wondering how your research covers the public's emotional response to media and how Snapchat has changed that um, and how, that, how you think that that compares to either, let's say, 
something like how 9-11 was covered fi just fi around 15 years ago and how there was footage rolling all um, on all news channels for all day mm. or even just platforms of new media platforms of this century as well that's a great question so I think okay I'm just showing you the public stories right in this in this bit if you're actually I mean when something huge happens I mean if it's an election or a, a terrorist attack or a disaster, wildfires, whatever. What's going to happen if that's something that affects you and your friends is you'll see the public stories, but you'll also see all your friends' stories and all your friends' one-to-one -one messages about it too. And so I think that becomes where the massive sort of um, affect probably comes in, right? Um, because you'll see your friends Cry, maybe crying and the selfie or, or whatever or being jubilant or you'll have like if you're at a wedding and 20 of your friends are at the same wedding you're going to see a lot of happy photos of people dancing and all these so it's this sort of multitude of stories if that is probably more important I guess taking the snap like when we look at the national day in Jordan it doesn't mean well it doesn't mean very much to me because I don't know much about that culture maybe some of you know more but if if it's a national day in Norway, there's going to be snap, there's going to be curated stories about it, and all my friends are going to be sharing pictures of themselves in their national costumes and so forth, and that's going to have much more of an asset and closer to what I think you're describing with the 9-11 um, thing. Plus, Snapchat isn't the only medium people are going to be using, of course. Yeah, yeah. But so it really, uh, the, the question of emotion is really interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in the idea of the archive because um, so what Snapchat is sort of working against a little bit is this idea of archiving all of this information and yet you're saying you save some of them. But I did a, a, a study at one point on Hurricane Sandy and the information, you know, the interest that peaks and then goes down at, after the event, after a few days or weeks past the event. <laughs> And all that information is still there. Those YouTube videos are still there. Mm. The information is, the you know, Wikipedia page is still there. The, um, all the news articles are still there, but the interest level has just totally collapsed. Um, so to some extent, I'm not, sh I, I, I guess I'm wondering if you've thought of how, how we value the archive and what it even means to archive something because we, we've collected all this, we're like digital pack rats. Mm. <laughs> you know, we just keep collecting more and more data for ourselves. I mean, I have thousands of photos on my phone. I, how can I even find one when I'm looking for it? Sometimes I can't. Mm. Um, and what, what value is that? Are we just deluding ourselves? And is Snapchat sort of forcing us to reconcile with the fact that experience is ephemeral. I am having countless experiences that I'm not even digitally capturing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like right now, well, mm -hmm. maybe not. <laughs> 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 no um, more. But you know, what, what, is that, what does it mean to want to capture everything and to then, how do we, what does it mean to let go of that? And I don't know, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of, Mm. I don't know if it's a rhetorical question or not, but um, it made me think of that. I do think Snapchat's doing some interesting things with that. I mean, the choice that it's, I mean, you could totally imagine that Snapchat just being endless. Like, you could just go back in time as long as you wanted. Right. You could imagine that, which would be really creepy, actually. <laughs> but there's other ways they've done some, like, I forgot to bring my spectacles, though. I think they <laughs> they lost a lot of money on the spectacles, but... There are some cool things about them, right? They're yellow sunglasses, and they've got little video cameras, and they connect to my Snapchat account through Bluetooth, right? Um, what they've done that's interesting is they cannot broadcast straight <coughs> to the internet or straight to Snapchat. What they do is you can record 10 seconds of video, that's it, and that goes to my phone um, to Snapchat, but in my private Snapchat, it doesn't automatically get sent out. And then I have to choose to go in and edit. And, and that's an interesting sort of limitation. I mean, I guess the product wasn't commercially viable in this incarnation, but, but it's an interesting choice in sort of adding constraints that aren't really necessary, which I think is connected to that. Because you're right, we have way too much stuff. There's no way we can, uh, we can use it all. I would love for at least the public stories to be at least available in some library so that in 20 years time we can go back and look at them. I do think that would be a good thing. But maybe they don't need to all be openly available on the web. 
think we had Jim, and then I guess you had your hand up, but I'll let you go after Jim, and then Bill again. <laughs> One of the things that I really liked about your talk is I have so many questions to <laughs> which there are no answers. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and one of them was kind of like it feels, I'll just shorten my question because it feels like hoarding. You know, yeah. I see this as a scholar and in a library, so it feels a little weird to say this. <laughs> but I kind of think like I wanted to, because I kept asking myself when you expressed a certain discomfort with the fact that it's gone, mm. and I had the same discomfort, I then thought, why? Yeah. Why am I uncomfortable with that? And, and why would that <coughs> include everything? What does that say about something, some sense of nostalgia? Or less? I know you, I, you said 20 years we could you applied sort of study it, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. And yet I, 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 <laughs> there seems like there are limits which we may have transgressed so that it's come to order. <laughs> and the other, just really briefly, is while you were talking about ephemerality and the, the, the peaking of stories, you had said, and Snapchat seems technologically different in a way, and it, it goes away in half an hour, it feels like, and I, I just wanted you to talk about this for a minute, maybe, is Snapchat in practice that different than, say, the news cycle is now no more than 24 hours? I mean, mm. you get, um, I just use an example, CNN, if a story in the national news, I know we're in a particularly uh, challenging time for national news with a particular, <laughs> but even before he was elected, it was a 24 hour news cycle. And people's interests seem to be, so I, I don't know. I don't know if it's the same, if it's different, if you have any mm. thoughts on this. Maybe Snapchat's just more honest. <laughs> because you're right, and even in, even in, like, Facebook, which does kind of archive everything, things become much less visible after, I mean, a post that's a day old is not so likely to pop up. It's very hard, yeah. 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 I never look at old posts Facebook. Stuff. Why bother? It's all news, right? But <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. Unless they call it up for you as a memory. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes. Which right. has a commercial value in some way that I can't figure out. <laughs> factored into all this too, right? So when it says our stories, one, who's the hour? Yeah. And two, how are they using that hour to serve their, I feel like it's a conspiracy, I don't mean it that way. How are they using the hour to serve their own investors' needs? Yeah. Absolutely. I think they're actually having a little trouble figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. They're in trouble right now. Snapchat is? Yeah, yeah. They haven't figured out how to make money. Really? Wow. It's true. At the same time as, you know, other platforms are stealing their ideas. So, I mean, the, the, the basic idea of this ephemeral stories and stuff is now part of Facebook, part of Instagram, which is maybe part of the reason why Snapchat's not. What, what's their difference? I, th I think one of the things that's different about Snapchat is that it's um, unabashedly immediate. Company, whereas Facebook and Twitter claim they're tech companies and they don't create media, whereas Although, Snapchat genuinely is. I'm, I'm going to sneak in. Yeah. The, the thing I thought was interesting is they, in one of your slides, they describe themselves as not a media company but a camera company. Oh, and you're right. They really do. That's a good point. Yes. Because it's not really a camera, right? But it's, <laughs> that's how they conceptualize what they're doing. It's also an interesting, um, I mean, the, the Snap Map, I think, is interesting. There have previously been projects like, uh, what are they called, Day in the Life and stuff where people, photographers and documentary um, creators have, you know, collected images from around the world for one day or people have, you know, everyone's written diaries and sent them into some communal project. There have been things like this, but this is like a continuous just generating of such a, a sort of, uh, you know, global narrative that's quite interesting. I mean, it's not genuinely global, obviously. You can see from the hotspots that some places are more snap happy than others. <laughs> so we have one, two, three, four. So we're out of time. So. <laughs> I don't know if this question is more applicable for Facebook um, and Twitter than Snapchat, but I'm wondering what you think the role is of the curators to control for like hate speech and mm -hmm. fake news, because I know that's a big question with Twitter, given the last election, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering I love the idea of personal ephemerality, but it makes me nervous, like handing over the authority for like what is news, what is legitimate, what should we should listen to, to some unknown curator. Yes, um, actually, I have a great example of that. that I'm just going to very briefly show you. Um, 
Because clearly there are advertisements, I mean, there are sponsors for these things, right? So I was paying lots of attention um, around Trump's inauguration. There were some interesting, um, uh, the way that the protests and the inauguration were presented on Snapchat was very much what you'd expect from sort of diversity, millennial, millennial kind of liberal sensitivity kind of. There was a, I mean, they were trying to be a little bit balanced, but not that balanced, really. <laughs> and then um, on January 26th, that's Australia Day, so it was just after, right? After this really pretty liberal presentation, um, they have an Australia Day live story. And I'm, um, my family's from Australia, so I know a bit about Australia Day. And I have plenty of friends in Australia, and they were all posting stuff about the huge marches because Australia Day is celebrated on the day of the European um, invasion slash settlement of Australia. Um, so a lot of people are saying we shouldn't celebrate the national day. On this day, we should choose a different day, please. And there were huge protests in every city. But the Snapchat Australia Day story was all these young white people in swimming pools drinking beer. <laughs> I mean, it was just like astounding. And you might notice that the, the filter that most I'm using is Triple J Hottest 100, because this is in the middle of the summer. January, Australia is hot. Triple J is like the popular youth radio station, and they have a countdown throughout the day, the top 100 most popular songs. And so that is a sort of, that is part of the celebration, but this is, it must be, it must be um, sponsored by Triple J, but you can't see that, right? It just looks like this is the story, this is the story of Australia Day. And uh, looking at Twitter, everyone was, um, because you can go and search for Snapchat <coughs> Australia Day or something like that. And I could just see hundreds and hundreds of people po posting stuff like, oh, Australia looks lit. I, my dream is to go to Australia on Australia Day and get in that pool. And it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, so it's not exactly fake news, but it's a very partial view of the world, right? And that's not obvi always obvious. And there's something about the sort of authenticity. I mean, these images were taken by people in the pool. These people were in the pool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for them, this was Australia Day. Um, and, but you don't know that you're only seeing a little bit of the world. And so that's clearly a danger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My comment was actually really similar to what Mike just brought up, and that's the question of the kind of like ethical responsibility of Snapchat as a news company versus more traditional forms of media, especially like print media, yeah. television news sources. Because while it might seem like it's this kind of collectively constructive narrative, there is someone sitting behind a desk somewhere making decisions because you don't just automatically post to a, you know, snap map story. You have to be curated by some anonymous employee. So then, is there a time where you think the people doing that at Snapchat will kind of face the same sort of regulatory or social pressure as other more traditional news networks do when they maybe post, you know, fake news or even just um, have to make really clear who their sponsors or advertisers are, that kind of thing. I think that's a fabulous question, and I think that's one of the problems with not archiving this material is that we can't check for that. You know, we can't go back and say, "Hey, this was a very unbalanced um, representation." I mean, in this case, I saw it the same day and I took photographs, but you, you can't do that systematically, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure quite quite sure how they would regulate it. They are doing things like you know the requirement to <coughs> mark things as ads to some extent, although th this was not marked as sponsored. Um, Maybe it w there's no way I can know whether it was really or not, but um, but I think this is a this is the sort of thing we need to be thinking about as a society, clearly, because uh, media is changing yeah. fast. Mm. Well, I was just thinking about a, a, a paradox that uh, we often talk about people experiencing an event or traveling or something. The, the, question of whether you should spend time uh, actually experiencing it firsthand or taking photos and recording it and seeing it through a lens all the time. And it seems to me that this creates this paradox, I mean, because the, either you experience it and you have it in your memory or you've taken photos and you can have that forever. But this, on the other hand, has the, the element of both and yet none. <laughs> you have. You, if you're spending your time actually recording in Snapchat, and then you, and then you don't have it, you know, if you don't save it, mm -hmm. and you 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 have this, you're not experiencing it directly, and at the same time, you don't 
it's, it's not saved, so you, you don't have the memory of it. So you, it creates this curious kind of... It's an interesting thing. point. <laughs> they have to start, unless you turn it off, it does save <coughs> your own things now. But, I, I mean, part of it is just changing media and media panics and things like... For I was reading an article about Edwardian postcards in England, like some very early 20th century postcards. Um, and they were citing some newspaper article criticizing people who send postcards, saying <laughs> that these people, they will, they will t you know, take the train to the, to, the, to the view at the top of the mountain, and they won't even look at the view. They'll just rush to buy a postcard and mail it instantly. <laughs> And it's like, that's kind of Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question was the same conspiracy question that these folks ah. asked. But, <laughs> and it is interesting what you have to say. But since that question has been taken, let me ask a trivial one, which is, do you understand what the icon is? What the sort of etymology of the icon is? Oh, the ghost? Yeah. Ghost. Oh, I should, I should really figure that out. There's a series <laughs> of thoughts around it. Oh, the dots around are oh. a QR code, but beautiful. I see. Um, I mean, because QR codes are... Yeah, it's my QR code. I don't know if you can't see it anymore. Um, I mean, that's not actually Snapchat's icon. That's my Snap code. <laughs> so the dots, if you take a photo of that yeah. in Snapchat, it will send you to my user and say, do you want to uh, follow her? Yeah. Yeah. So, because you've seen QR codes, they're really yeah. ugly, yeah. right? Yeah. So I do think it's interesting that they yeah. found a way of sort but, of... But also the, 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 the ghost of that sort of... Well, I assume the ghost has to do with ephemerality. Yeah. Does anyone yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, that's so why they chose it like that. Yeah. Hmm. But ghosts live on. Oh! <laughs> 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 I don't understand. <laughs> 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 So before everybody filters away, thank you. Thank you for a great discussion.